All right, good afternoon, folks. Um, I'm so glad to see so many of you here. We have room, if you want to sit on the floor, please come up and join me here. Um, I don't bite. Um, and you probably saw that I was having a little bit of technical difficulty. I was hoping to use my keynote slides, which had a couple animations, but we're going to have to use the PDF slides because I can't. I can't get Keynote to work on this particular computer. Um, if you are on Twitter, I just tweeted a link to the slides and they're on my website uh, if you want to follow along there. Um, my name is Amelia McNamara. I teach in the program in Statistical and Data Sciences here, and I see some familiar faces, so I know some of you are in classes there. And today I want to talk about algorithmic accountability. Uh, but before we um, sort of get started, I just want to do like hashtag privilege alert. Um, I am white, straight, cisgender, middle class, highly educated. I have a PhD. Um, I'm an American citizen. Uh, and so I'm doing the best I can when I talk about these kind of sensitive issues of race and class and gender. Um, and and, but I wasn't trained to, to have these kinds of conversations. So um, I'm doing my best, but you should always feel free to call me out, uh, either just like publicly, put your hand up and say something to me, or talk to me later and, and I'll try to be better in the future. Um, if you're just joining us, there's room on the floor in the front if you wanna come get co close and cozy. Uh, and there's a couple, I think there's a couple chairs. Well, maybe not. Maybe people are kind of filled in. We've got one chair there. Are you saving that one? So, there's a chair there. OK, cool. Um, all right. So uh, if, if you're not familiar with algorithms, this is the definition just straight off of Google. Um, algorithms, an algorithm is any process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations, especially by a computer. Yeah, welcome. Come in. Come. There's room in the center aisle to sit on the floor or, or in the front. There's like lots of room over here, and I probably won't even wander in this direction. So you'd be safe if you sat there. Cool. OK, so an algorithm is something um, that like a computer uses to, to, uh, to solve problems or to, to, to operationalize something. And um, that, that Definition makes it sound like it's this kind of neutral uh, thing that that is operating beyond the realm of human fallibility, um, and some algorithms uh, are are neutral. Um, if I was using my keynote presentation, you would be able to see this beautiful animation of sorting algorithms using bubble sort and merge sort. So. Um, an, Algorithms like that, I think, are pretty neutral. Um, but many algorithms are based on data. And data is political. So the personal is political, and data is personal, and data is political. Um, so whatever is going on in the world, uh, in terms of the biases that, are, that exist in society, um, that is getting sort of translated through to the data that's being used in algorithms. So um, I want to start with kind of a brainstorming session where I'm going to have you talk to people that you're sitting near. And what we're going to be brainstorming about is our own data exhaust. So um, every day when we're interacting with people and um, computers and devices, we are generating data, whether we're conscious of it or not. So I wear a Fitbit, and that means that every time I take a step, I'm generating data. Um, of course, I had to choose to consciously put that device on my body, and so I know that I'm generating that data, but there's lots of other times when I'm unconsciously generating data. It's sort of incidental to whatever it is that I'm trying to do, and um, it's kind of flowing off of me as data exhaust. So what I want you to do is with um, maybe two of your neighbors that you are near, try and generate a list, and if you can, try and be exhaustive all the places that you are generating data on a normal day. So I'm going to give you like maybe three or five minutes to talk amongst yourselves and try and generate a list of all your data exhaust.
lull. So um, I want us to talk about this together. So um, can some of you like shout out some of the uh, places that you thought of that you generate data? Cookies on the internet, okay. So um, for those of us that aren't familiar, uh, what are cookies? Totally. So, um, so your internet browsing is a way that you're generating data. What else? Yeah. Uh, social media. Social media. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, like uh, Facebook. Yeah. There's lots of stuff. So, um, like who you're friends with. That's some data um, that we know. Friends with uh, what you like. What, what other data might we be able to, to infer from your social media presence? Yeah. What kind of pictures you post? Um, what kind of pictures you post? Uh, no, pictures. Your political ideology. Oh, yeah, your politics. Location you go. Um, your location, OK. Yeah, just a bunch of stuff. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. But there's, there's a ton to unpack about social media. What else? Yeah, your one card swipes. Totally. Yes? We'll just swipe on Tinder. <laughs> OK, so, um, so swipes on Tinder. And, and what would we know from that? Um, like what types of people that you're liking, what types of people that you're not liking. What types of people you like. <laughs> yeah. And, and not like just friends with, but you, like you like like, right? <laughs> OK, uh, what else? Yeah. OK, public transit. Again, that's sort of like the one card. Public transit, maybe like swipes. OK. Uh, I saw a hand here. Yeah. Um, Google Maps actually can track like, your location for like, everywhere. Totally, Google Maps. Or uh, so I'm going to put Google, and then I'm going to put in parentheses maps. What else does Google know about you? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> OK, your, your search history. Everything. Yeah, OK. Um, what about over here? Yeah. Uh, your, credit card purchases? your credit card purchases. Yeah, exactly. Credit card purchases. I'm running out of room. Uh, what else? The printing OK. Um, so yeah, printing. Printing on campus. On campus. So how many pages? Um, and, and maybe what kinds of content, uh, if it's black and white, if it's color, um, how, yeah, everything like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, oh. oh. You go ahead. Oh, <laughs> kind of silly. Um, I, I'm Google professors can see if you've like, read something, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Moodle. <laughs> read it. We know if you clicked on it, right? Yeah, that's different. Yeah. OK, so, um, so like your car mileage. I'm just going to go crazy here. Car mileage. What else does your car know about you? Sometimes your car knows about your location. Yeah. Um, there's like tons of data. Like cars have computers in them, and they're tracking all kinds of stuff, actually. Uh, what else? Yeah. Ooh, toll by plate, totally, yeah. Um, OK, uh, here. Airport security, yeah. Um, we, so we can go on and on, but I, I'll just take two more, maybe. Um, here, yeah. Oh, OK, Fitbit, yep. And here. Stopped by a cop. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, so that's that's not that's not exhaustive in terms of all the data that we're giving off, but it gives you an idea of like every time you do something, just about there's some electronic record that is being generated. Data is is coming off of you, and um, it could be used in in different ways. And the point of this kind of conversation is to think about the ways that that data can be used for good or for bad. Um, and what I want us to think about just for another second before we leave this exercise is how were humans involved in the data generating process of these data that you thought about. So um, like, uh, I don't know, like the credit card purchases. How was a human involved in generating that data? Let's just think about that for a minute. Yeah. By generating, do you mean, do you mean creating a construct of? Sure, yeah. So, so the thing that I want to convey here is that um, data gets generated mostly by computers these days. I mean, uh, there's there's other ways that you generate data, but a lot of these examples that we um, that we came up with they're digital data. And again, it feels like somehow it's this very like truthy process that the that the computer is generating data that is somehow very true. But the computer is something that that humans control and humans decided how they were going to record the data. So um, with the credit card uh, purchases, you know, someone had to write the program that, um, that recorded how much information uh, is, is going to be conveyed. Like, are you going to store just the last four digits of the card, or are you going to store the whole card number? Are you just going to store the, um, the category of the store that you went to? Or are you going to store the entire uh, name of the store and the address and, and all that information? Um, of course, you know, humans are making decisions at Google about what information to keep about your map history, your search history, um, all these things. So, so, so humans are building computers, and we have to remember that humans are, are involved in the data generating process. And then they're, of course, involved in the ways that data get used in algorithms. So um, I, I want us to remember data, all data, even though it seems like a computer generated it, it's actually generated by people. Um, Sometimes we think of weather data or physics data or uh, you know chemistry data. There's very scientific things. Is there's no human involved. It's just a sensor. But a human designed that sensor and and chose the tolerances and um, and is involved in the process. Um, and then all this data that is about people is um, about us, it has to come from the past because we don't have data about the future. And so because the past is biased, then the data that we have is biased. So for those of you that just came in, there's some space to sit on the floor in the front here if you want to be bold and come up. No? OK. Um, so so we've, got, we've, got, we've got data, but it's biased. Um, and when we're thinking about algorithms, uh, at least you know, sort of my interest in algorithms is considering the data that's feeding the algorithms, where that data comes from, who or what gets, is missed in that data, and then the biases that are going to come into the algorithm with that data. So um, with, the, with the data that we brainstormed, um, who is m like mostly getting counted in those data sets? Yeah. People who own phones and computers who are sort of digital, um, digital natives. So if you're not, if you're not uh, someone who's using a computer, you're not represented in this data for good or bad. Um, who else or what else is missing? Absolutely, yeah. So there's these like proxies that are that are coming in. Um, we're thinking about people with credit cards. Like we're only seeing people with credit cards, and maybe we, that's what we care about. But um, but credit card use it tends to correlate with higher income or higher social class, and so we're missing people of like very particular groups. So this is um, what statisticians call like missing not at random. There's some pattern to the data that's not being captured, and we want to think about that when we think about the algorithms. Um, 
And I think uh, the way that I'm going to do the rest of this session is I'm going to tell you sort of like a, a class of, of algorithms, um, talk about a, a hopefully relatively neutral way that the algorithm gets used, then show you some ways that it has been used for, for nefarious purposes. So my first example is sentiment analysis. And um, so the, the neutral example, it's getting a little cut off on the bottom, but this is from um, the book Text Mining with R, A Tidy Approach. Uh, and this is sentiment analysis of the text of Jane Austen's novels. And so what they've done is they've run this algorithm that has a corpus of English words, and it has some um, connection between a word and whether it's a positive or negative word. And then they've, they've run this algorithm that counts up uh, positive and negative words and, and shown how on uh, the page of the book things are more positive or more negative. Um, I don't think I've actually read Mansfield Park, but for those of you that have, like, does this make sense that it's like sort of generally positive and then like something really bad happens near the end and then there's like some resolution at the very, very end? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, so this is kind of a neutral way to use sentiment analysis uh, to analyze some corpus of literature. But uh, companies have learned that they can use sentiment analysis to get computers to know more about what people are saying online. And they'll use them to, um, for example, see what the, uh, the feeling is about a brand using people's statements on Twitter or something like that. Um, and the problem is that sentiment analysis is biased. So this is from uh, an article called Google Sentiment Analyzer Thinks Being Gay is Bad. And uh, you can see that if you feed in the text, I'm a Christian, it came out with a, a slightly positive sentiment, you know, 0 0.01, that's positive. Uh, if you say I'm a Sikh, then it's a little bit more positive. But if you say I'm a Jew, then it says it's slightly negative. Okay. Uh, the same thing, um, if you wrote, I'm a gay black woman, it says that's a negative sentiment. And I'm a straight French bro was a positive sentiment. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then uh, being a dog was totally neutral. <laughs> um, Homosexual, a little bit negative, and then homosexual dog was, was more negative. So my question is, where did this data come from? The data in this algorithm that is determining that these sentiments are negative or positive. So just take a couple seconds and talk to your neighbor about where, where did this data come from? idea about how how Google got this idea that um, being homosexual is bad yeah Totally, yeah. So, so the initial, um, the way that people did sentiment analysis, like with that Jane Austen example, is there's a corpus of words. A corpus is like a collection of words. Um, and a human or a bunch of humans have gone in and assigned sentiment to words, saying like this is negative or this is positive. Um, I don't think that that's actually where this stuff about being homosexual, um, having a negative sentiment is coming from. Yeah. Surrounding it, we can infer, like, oh, people are usually looking at this word in a negative 
Absolutely, yes. So that's what Google is doing. It's, it's sort of bootstrapping from the corpus that was already there, where someone went through and was like, ah, Apple, that seems positive. And you know, like, uh, falling seems negative. And, and then they used that, that small corpus that people had generated. And then they used machine learning or artificial intelligence to try and extrapolate to other things. So they said, let's look at a bunch of statements about that include the word homosexual. And let's see if those have negative or positive words. And Again, because data comes from the past and it's biased, people were saying negative things about homosexuals. And so Google's algorithm decided that that had to have a negative sentiment. Um, so uh, this is like sort of a, a positive thing. Um, this article got published, and a Google spokesperson responded and said, "You know, we dedicate a lot of efforts to making sure that our NLP (Natural Language Processing) API (Application Programming Interface) avoids bias, but we don't always get it right. Um, this is an example of one of those times. We're sorry. We're working on improving our models. We corrected this specific case, and more broadly, we're trying to build more inclusive algorithms. So, uh, so it was brought to their attention, and then they." They went and fixed it. Um, if you go look at that article, there's a link to the, way, the Google sentiment analyzer. And you can actually put in some phrases if you want to test it out. Uh, and it doesn't have these, um, these particular sentiments anymore. So they've, they've fixed that one little corner, um, corner case. OK, another class of problems that uh, you know, sort of machine learning or artificial intelligence or algorithms get applied to is this prediction or classification problem. So the classic example is spam detection. You have a spam filter that knows how to classify if an email is spam or not spam based on some rules. Okay. Uh, but prediction and classification can get used in, um, in kind of insidious ways. Uh, so this is uh, an article that was done by ProPublica about machine bias. And um, it turns out that it used to be the case that when you committed a crime and you came in front of a judge, the judge would decide uh, what your risk of recidivism was, how likely it was that you were going to commit another crime. And they would, um, they would think about that, and they would decide whether they were going to let you out on bail or on parole, or if they were going to put you into prison. Um, and of course, because people are biased, they were making biased decisions about who should um, go to prison and who should not. And so uh, these, these companies um, started a sort of startup business model by saying, ah, we're going to take the human out of the equation. We're going to make an algorithm that decides recidivism risk. And um, so then the, the judge doesn't have to make that judgment. It's going to be decided by the computer. Um, and uh, again, if I had my keynote slides, you'd see a little video. There's a, there's a scroll over for each of these sort of pairs of um, people that they call out in the article. So um, this uh, guy on the left, he was rated a low risk by the algorithm. And the woman on the right was rated a high risk. But then if you look at the data that sort of went into the model, um, this guy had a bunch of um, like misdemeanors uh, and maybe some like uh, some larger crimes. She had like some juvenile offenses, uh, like loitering, like sort of nothing. Um, and he went on to reoffend, and she did not. Okay, so it, the algorithm is getting it wrong, um, and it it turns out that they they sort of looked at the um, the outcomes, and it was biased against black people. So again, I want you to think about where did the data come from here, just for a second, and then we'll talk about it. that was being used in this algorithm? Anyone have any ideas? Hand in the back, yeah. Past defense, past criminal yes, it was from past criminal offenses. Um, anyone have any other ideas about the data? Yeah, so it's, it definitely is biased toward people who got caught. Um, what else is it biased toward? 
Yes, yeah, that turns out to be like a major part of this, um, of this uh, uh, recidivism score is whether you have family members who are in jail or who have ever gone to jail. Okay, other thoughts? Yeah. Um, I believe they left the judges into it, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, yep. Like socioeconomic status? Uh, yeah, I think they use that as well. So, um, so when there was some criticism about this algorithm being um, biased against black people, they went to the algorithm designers and they said, like, your algorithm is biased. And the algorithm de designers said, well, we didn't use race in our model. It's not in there, so how could it possibly be racist? Okay, so uh, I'm sure that you can imagine how it possibly could be without explicitly including race. Can you give me some ideas? Geography. Hmm? Geography. Geography. Yeah. So there's proxies like where you live. Yeah. So even if the, the algorithm's like working a certain way, if the data that it's pulling from has racial bias, then it's going to be bias. Absolutely. If the data that you're pulling from has racial bias, then that racial bias is going to just get built into the algorithm. Um, and there's other proxies. Yeah. Yeah, there's intersectionality. Um, so I think that it did use something about like their credit scores or something, right? So, so people with poor credit scores, it was like, well, they're going to commit more crimes. Who knows if there's any evidence for that, right? Um, but, but yeah, so there were all these things about like because we have this systemic racism where black people are being stopped more often, they're being arrested more often, they're going to jail more often for um, sort of petty crimes, then if you get arrested, it's more likely, if you're a black person, that your parents have gone to jail before. And again, so that's going to count against you. And it's just sort of like, again, reifying this, this systemic thing. So I don't have like a super happy story. Um, about about this one, although the article does say that some of the judges are like, well, when I first started, I used the algorithm to help advise me, and now, uh, like, I I think I've got the feeling for it, so I just kind of figure it out myself again. So, um, but I think that the the federal. Um, government has suggested the use of these scores and and no one has like a really good version of them yet so so that's like sort of a horrifying example this is getting kind of loud i'm gonna close that a little okay um similar kind of idea uh this is um uh, an article uh, called Policing the Future. And this one is like, oh, it's not that old, I guess. It's 2016. Um, but it's about uh, crime predicting software. And so the St. Louis County Police Patrol started using this algorithm that would try to tell them where they should be policing because it thought that there were going to be crimes committed there. So you can see like there's um, you know the, the neighborhoods and then the hot spots where the algorithm believes there's going to be crimes. Um, uh, here again, you know, here's where we think there's going to be aggravated assault, gun crime, trespassing, homicide. Uh, so I think um, we probably don't need to have like a long discussion, but where, where did this data come from that's feeding the algorithm? Previous arrests, previous, um, previous crimes, and, and where's the bias there? The police, right? Where the police are going and, and doing um, policing and where they're, again, predominantly arresting people of color, those places are going to look like they're high crime, um, and the, the algorithm is going to keep telling you to go look there for crime. OK? Um, <laughs> Yeah, this one is too cute. Uh, so this is another example of um, an algorithm that uh, gets used a lot. So, so people in machine learning or artificial intelligence are really interested in image recognition. And this is what makes self-driving cars possible. Um, and there's like a whole host of other things that we hope is um, going to become um, possible if, if computers can learn how to see. And so these are like some sort of silly examples of, you know, could a computer tell the difference between this chihuahua and that muffin or that labradoodle and some fried chicken so like these are tasks that humans are pretty good at distinguishing between images uh, but computers might not be 
And it's kind of the same thing as the um, sentiment analysis with the text example. Um, people had to go uh, initially and tag data sets with what was in the image. And then we trained algorithms to be able to look for things in pictures. Uh, I think you can probably imagine some of the ways that image recognition um, can sort of go wrong. Uh, one really uh, highly publicized version uh, was this. Um, this is from 2015. A major flaw in Google's algorithm allegedly tagged two black people's faces with the word gorillas. So um, if you've used Google Photos, it will try to organize your photos for you and put together similar images. And then it'll tag what it thinks it sees, what object it sees in the image. And you can see you know, these two people were taking some selfies, and, and Google thought that they were gorillas. OK? Um, so uh, I'll give you a second um, to think about where this data came from, and then we're going to talk about it. OK, so you can talk amongst yourselves. Let's think about algorithm? What was the problem with it? Yeah? Um, well, my guess is that there's a lot of white supremacist activity on the internet. So white supremacists, they have tagged, um, tagged photos. Um, and then the algorithm uh, included that when it was um, when searching. And so uh, it became biased. Data. I think that's totally possible that white supremacists were asked to tag images, and they were mistagging them to make the algorithms um, work incorrectly. I don't think that's actually what happened, but it is possible. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it has to do with the training data. So when you when you have a machine learning algorithm, you often have training data that you train your model on, and then you test it on other on other data. So if in your um, in your training data, whenever you um, said like this is a person, and the image that you had was of a white person, then the algorithm doesn't have any way to generalize to black people, right? If you didn't have any of that data in in the original um, the the original data set. Other thoughts? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, and it's been shown that um, that com like uh, uh, cameras, both physical cameras and digital cameras, were designed like to let light in in a particular way to like take nice pictures of white people's faces. So this has been a problem with like black models um, and and being able to like light them properly or have the right settings on the camera to capture dark skin tones. So so that's part of the problem as well. Is like the camera is kind of biased against them. And then um, I think you're right. There's like because of that, there's less contrast um, and it's a more challenging image recognition problem. Uh, what else? Yeah.
Hmm. I'm not sure I completely understand, but um, so when machine learning algorithms learn from images, they, they have to kind of generalize from the features that are in the training data set. And again, if that training data set only had white people's faces, then it sort of is like, well, white means like person, right? Um, so, so it has this sort of this inability to, to generalize beyond that. I think another thing that's going on here is the team that developed these algorithms probably was all white, right? Because if you were a black person and you worked on this team, I think you would notice pretty quickly that pictures of you were getting tagged incorrectly, and hopefully you would, um, you would be able to raise that to people who could, who could make a difference, right? Um, and, and there's actually like a huge number of problems with image recognition software, um, not being able to distinguish between um, black people's faces. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the example, I didn't put it in here, of the um, uh, paper towel dispenser, where it's like an automatic paper towel dispenser, and if you put like dark hands underneath, it does nothing, and then you like stick a white hand underneath, it's like, oh, here's a paper towel, right? So just the fact that it wasn't tested, um, the algorithm wasn't tested against like a whole range of people led to this like sort of terrible thing, okay? Um, uh, oh, I don't have it here. Again, um, Google apologized. Uh, they decided to remove the gorilla category, and the, that was sort of their fix, which, <laughs> that's not like, that's not like the best fix, but I, like it sort of is a hack for the moment, right? Um, and and they're like, we're again, they're like trying to do better, okay? Um, this one is via the Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, a beauty contest was judged by AI, and the robots didn't like dark skin. Um, and so again, like the group did not build the algorithm to treat light skin as a sign of beauty, but the input data effectively led the robot judges to reach that conclusion. So uh, I'll just give you a second to think about where the data came from. I, I think it's getting easier and easier. Okay. So, so what, what happened here? Where did the data come from? P previous beauty pageant winners. Yep. Um, and, and so, again, it's just like the bias that was present in society is getting carried through into this algorithm. Again, the people who designed the algorithm are like, well, we didn't put in um, race as a, as a um, deciding factor or as a variable in this model? Well, but you kind of did by choosing how you um, structured your input data. Uh, and then uh, the last kind of um, algorithmic task that I want to talk about uh, is tailoring. And we see this the most with ad tailoring. So uh, these are some tailored ads that I've received on Instagram and Facebook. This is like a time tracking thing because I'm always looking for better time tracking things. And then I use Virgin Mobile. So they, they're advertising Virgin uh, Mobile to me on, on Facebook. They somehow have connected my data to know what I'm using. Okay, um, and and tailoring can go wrong in in many ways. So so this is uh, maybe a more minor version. This one is pretty old. I think this is from 2012. So you might be familiar with it. Um, it's from an article called "How Companies Learn Your Secrets," and it focused a lot on Target, the retail giant. Um, and what they, what Target realized is that it's hard to get people to change their shopping habits. If you go to the same grocery store, you're basically going to keep going there for the rest of your life. People like get very ingrained in their shopping habits. But there are a few times in your life where you might change. So like moving from one place to another, that's a big life transition. If you get married, sometimes that's enough. And then especially, especially when you have a baby, uh, you are much more likely in that life transition to change where you shop. And uh, the data about babies that get born um, in the United States uh, is like freely available. The Social Security Administration makes it available. So if you're someone who has had a baby, I'm sure you've had this experience of you have the baby and immediately you start getting tons of mail, like all kinds of coupons about diapers and formula and um, Babies R Us, stuff like that. 
Uh, but because that data was available after the fact, it just was like people had this onslaught of information, um, and, and it was too late to kind of capture this retail market. So what Target decided to do is try to predict before the person had the baby, predict if they're pregnant. Okay? And so um, they were able to tell based on like later shopping patterns, right? Because you're pregnant for nine months, like that's a long time of shopping. Um, they have data about your like credit card history, what you've purchased at Target, um, or they could buy your credit card history at many, many different stores. And they knew that, that people had different um, buying habits. So they trained this model, which um, would predict if someone was pregnant based on a bunch of different things. And the, the people who, who trained the model said it came up with variables that kind of made no sense to them. Some of them made a little more sense. Like you start buying folic acid, um, like vitamins, and you buy unscented lotion, it turns out, uh, maybe because you like have more sensitive smell or because the doctor told you it was better for the baby, whatever. So there's like kind of different things that, that can show that you're getting pregnant. So, um, so the kind of like crucial example in this, uh, in this story is um, this father comes into Target and he's furious. He says, uh, you know, my daughter got this in the mail. She's still in high school. You're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? And Target, of course, apologizes. They're like, it's just a model. We don't actually know. We're just like doing our best inference, and like we shouldn't have done that. Uh, and then, like a couple weeks later, he comes back and apologizes and says, actually, um, I talked to my daughter. I, I wasn't aware that she was pregnant, um, and and so actually, the model was right. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think I, I kind of gave it away, like where the data came from. Um, it, it came from credit card purchases. Um, it came from like them buying, being able to aggregate data. This is something that companies can do: is buy data from other sources and, and combine it together because we're pretty identifiable um, using just a few pieces of information. So uh, it, it's sort of like handy, maybe if you are someone who's expecting a baby. Maybe it is kind of nice to get some coupons for baby things. Um, Target actually figured out that it was too creepy for people. Like, <laughs> it, not just in this situation, but like if you are, are like in your first trimester of pregnancy and, and Target sends you a booklet of coupons that are all about baby things, you're like, whoa, I am creeped out, Target is spying on me. So what they had to do is they create these targeted ad mailers that have like a lawnmower and then some diapers and then like marker, like they just sort of blend it in so that you, you're just like, oh, how convenient. Like what a random coincidence, this is baby things. Um, so like they're, they're trying to hide the algorithm uh, while also creating this very tailored content. Um, okay, uh, there's been a lot of publicized examples recently about Google and Facebook allowing people, like advertisers, to do super targeted ads based on racist phrases. So, uh, so this was um, like some, some phrases that, that Google was allowing you to, um, to target on. Uh, again, I'm going to let you think for a minute about where that data came from. Um, and talk to your neighbor, and then we'll talk about it. So keywords like black people ruin everything, Jewish parasite, and Jews control the media. Where did that data come from? I'm not sure what data you're to. The, the, this information, like those phrases, how were they able to target that, those people? based on these phrases like how how is this happening they know search terms yeah yeah 
Yeah, exactly. So Google wasn't doing any type of quality control about like, should we maybe filter out some, some racist phrases? And because people are searching for these things, racist people on the internet, then it knows that this is a good quality but low traffic keyword. OK, so like that if if someone is searching for black people ruin everything that that they're going to be likely to click on an ad related to whatever racist thing it is that you're selling. So again, um, it's it's like sort of based. It's the data that is coming from us as like a racist society. And then um, like from the top down, you're right. Um, like Google is not being proactive in removing things that are offensive. Uh, so again, um, when this BuzzFeed article went live, then Google says this violates our policies and we've removed it. Um, and so like they, they, they fixed it again, right? But this is like really unsatisfying that people have to uncover these, um, these racist things. And then once you do it, Google's like, oh, well, we'll fix it now. OK, so um, I think I have one more example. Yeah, so this is um, an example. Uh, Latanya Sweeney is a really cool computer scientist. She has this lab called the Data Privacy Lab. And she noticed, she's a black woman, that when she searched for her name, the ads that Google was coming up with were like Latanya Sweeney arrested, question mark. OK, so she's like a super educated lady. She has a PhD. Um, she's a professor. And, and those are not the terms that you would expect to be coming up with her name. And so she, she wrote this paper and concluded that searches with, quote, black sounding names are more likely to get results with ads for arrest records and other negative information. Um, I don't think I have a, a where did this data come from, but again, it's coming from people's racist Google searches and Google not doing like any quality control about this stuff. And it turns out that ads are being served in in these like dis um, like unequal ways for all kinds of things. Like predatory um, universities tend to put ads when they think someone is like has low income. Um, and uh, there was recently a case um, some Someone who was living in a country where uh, homosexuality is um, like a uh, punishable offense was getting ads served for um, gay resorts because of his search history, and they showed up on his screen when he was doing a presentation to like his boss. Right. So these things like they can have impacts on people's lives, the, like the way that their life. Um, kind of unfolds if you're clicking on the things that Google thinks are recommended for you, and then they can also have like these really real impacts on um, on like your job and your life and your livelihood. Okay. Um, so there's been a little bit of transparency from companies about this. I put the links here. So you can go on Facebook and look at your ad preferences. So these are mine. This is not stuff that I have told Facebook. Well, I think it knows my birthday is in April because I put that in. But like away from hometown, away from family, US politics, very liberal. <laughs> Yeah, surprise, surprise. Uh, close friends of expats, African American, uh, frequent travelers, Facebook access, mobile. So it has inferred these things about me, um, and it's using, it's like allowing people to serve ads based on what it has inferred. So you can go and look and see um, what Facebook thinks about you. You can also see what Google thinks about you. Um, let's see, I, I, these are like reasonably accurate. Uh, Cooking and recipes, fashion and style, books and literature. Um, these are like pretty, pretty neutral. Cats. I'm not that into cats, actually. <laughs> but okay, so, but like, it's like sort of funny, but it's also not right that that um, that these companies have so much power over our lives, and they are just allowed to infer things about us and then um, make decisions about what we're going to see or not see. Um, and of course, there's like many, many other places where um, algorithms are are showing us um, things or not showing us things. Okay, I'm riled up. Now what? Um, so uh, I want us to do a brainstorm about how we can fight back about algorithmic inequality. Um, I have some ideas on the next slide. Uh, the first thing that I want us to do, um, and I got this idea from Nancy Young in the archives, we're all going to stand up and we're going to shake it off, and then we're going to think about it. Oh. Mm.
Okay, so your, your task is to talk to your neighbors and try and think of some ways that we can fight back against um, these algorithms that are controlling our lives in these, these nefarious ways. that we can, we can do to fight back against this. Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah. Turn off your cookies. OK, yeah, so, um, so turn off cookies. Um, turn off cookies. You could uh, use private browsing. Um, what are some other uh, sort of like information security techniques? Yeah. Yeah, to like to fool. Okay, so let's see. I'll write it. Track me not. Track me not. Um, to fool Google. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I totally agree. I think we need, we need regulation. And some countries have regulations. Like um, There's a bunch of uh, European countries that have made it so that you can request all the data that, uh, that a company has on you or that you can opt out in a way. Like most of the time, um, when you at, like, add yourself on a social media site, you just click yes to that terms and conditions thing. And there's no like, well, I want to use it, but not if you're going to do this, right? Like it's just a all in or all out. And, and that is a choice that the designers made. Um, here, yeah. So like before a lot of these products get released, they go through extensive user testing. And I think they should place the burden on tech companies to diversify who they use for testing. Yeah, so we need to diversify, diversify uh, the tech industry, like both the like developers and the testers and the researchers, everyone, right? Yeah, OK. Yeah. OK, so like regulation about, about companies, um, about political ads. Yeah, was there another hand here before? No, OK, yeah. Um, I think that along with diversity in the tech industry, um, like it shouldn't just be like, your excuse for not having a product that serves all people shouldn't be that you don't have diversity on your team. So I think companies also need to invest in training the people that they do have. And if they don't have a diverse group yet, like they each person can be one that isn't a white group um, are rare because they're capable of being aware. Yes. Like, um, and like you said, like they don't have to be the company. Yes. Is there another hand? Other thoughts? 
No? OK, let's see if there was anything that I came up with that you guys didn't think about. OK, so, um, so here are some of the things that I thought of. So just like keeping your eyes open um, and trying to be like aware, I think that um, algorithms can really slide into the background. And like I said, they can feel like they're neutral or that the computer's doing it or there's nothing that we can, um, like they can't be changed. They just are the way they are. And that's not true. So like being aware is really good. If you are like a faculty member or staff person and you have money, I think that supporting investigative journalism is a really important thing to do. So ProPublica did a bunch of those investigations that I that I highlighted that um, that have really brought these things to light. Like we wouldn't have known about the those recidivism scores being biased against black people if ProPublica hadn't gone and done like a Freedom of Information Act like a FOIA request and and then run the algorithm to see that there were these desperate outcomes. So if you can if you can throw money at the problem, you should do that. Um, for the Smithies who are like thinking about going out into the world and maybe have some data skills, I want you to use your data skills for good. So I think we need like a code of ethics for people that work with data. And I think it could start with the like first do no harm. Like, and uh, many of these algorithms are doing serious, serious harm, and people aren't thinking about how that could happen. Um, I've already talked about diversity. Uh, I think you know there's there's. We don't want to put the onus on um, minorities to be like the token person, um, but if if you can go and like be a force for good in a tech giant, I think that's a really worthwhile thing to do. And then we were talking about like um, transparency and regulation and, and talking to the representatives in the government. Uh, this is um, a piece that I love by Jared Thorpe, where he's talking about how um, we should design data systems for the well-being of the people from whom the data is taken. And this is like, again, data streams off of us as data exhaust, and we never see it again. We don't have any control over it. It just gets owned by companies or by the government. And so this should be like a principle that the, the system should work for the people from whom the data is taken. You need feedback mechanisms. You want to honor the individual and community realities. Um, and, and we need more people who are data literate. So that's what we're trying to do here in Smith at the Statistical and Data Sciences Program. Um, so, so that's something to do. Uh, I put some links to some talks that I think are really amazing. Uh, so the woman who did the Algorithmic Justice League, um, her name is Joy, and she has a TED talk about fighting bias in algorithms. Um, Matt Mitchell has a talk about Cyber Jim Crow. Uh, and what is like sort of horrifying is that there's like very little overlap in these talks and the things that I talked about. Uh, I would recommend that you read uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. Did anyone go see Kathy O'Neill when she spoke at Mount Holyoke? Yeah, so uh, she wrote this paper or this book about how big data increases um, inequality and threatens democracy. Again, uh, almost no overlap in the like horrifying things that I talked about today and the horrifying things that she talks about in her book. Um, if you want something a little more like uplifting and, and critical, uh, Dana Boyd, who actually came and spoke at Smith last year, uh, and Kate Crawford have this critical questions for big data, provocations for a cultural, technological, and scholarly phenomenon, um, which has like these questions that we should be asking when we're using quote unquote big data. Uh, Kate Crawford also just started, I saw uh, the link online today, this like AI institute, which is um, again fighting back against algorithmic um, uh, algorithmic bias. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to do was just plug a couple things at Smith. So there's this conference called Data for Black Lives at MIT November 17th through 19th. And uh, the conference sold out. They don't have room for more people to go there. We were hoping to bring some Smithies. And we actually had some funding from the college, but we like missed the deadline and we couldn't, um, we couldn't work the back channels to get people to be able to go physically. So Ben Bomber, my colleague in statistical and data sciences, is organizing a local watching party for the remote conference. Um, I think I, I sort of feel bad sending you all to email him, but you should let, let him know that you're interested. Uh, I think we're going to be able to like have some food, and I think we're going to have like a big room, and, and we'll watch some of the talks here. Um, like I said, ProPublica is like amazing. They're really on the forefront of this work. And I'm going to host at least one of their journalists next semester um, for a big talk at Smith. So watch out for that. And then if you are interested in becoming a data journalist, uh, plug for my course next semester. SDS 236 is data journalism. And we're going to talk about um, algorithmic reporting as well. So um, 
Thanks for coming. Thanks. I'm glad to see so many of you interested in this. And